Hebrews chapter 8 first. In Hebrews 8, I'll start reading from verse 7. Read from verse 7. <coughs> For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So he talked about the old covenant was not sufficient. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. And now he speaks about the new covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Now obviously he's talking about the church. And here's another passage besides uh, Romans, uh, Romans 2, uh, and besides Galatians, where we emphatically are the new Israel and the Jews who were circumcised not of the flesh but of the heart. And it is false concept that all these promises of Israel belong to the church. In verse 10, For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put, not, I will put my laws in their mind. Now let's have a little look at uh, the word put. Didomi, it's an interesting word. Uh, Hebrew, uh, Greek word didomi is the one that is used. Look at all the different shells of meaning of didomi. It's uh, venture, bestow, bring forth, commit, deliver, give. From what I learned in uh, New Testament Greek long ago when I studied Greek, didomi is like a gift, a gift into you. So normally when you look at the word uh, give, uh, uh, put, you might not see the giving part. But it's like not giving it to you. like uh, uh, In a sense of like a gift. And, uh, <clears throat> give grant. It's a grant. Deliver up uh, uh, the minister and all the various possible usage. There is that. See the word didomi, the root words. To give. To give something to someone or one's own. And uh, when you research deeper, let's choose one. Analytical. Okay, let's see what the analytical gives us. Uh, it just gives all the uh, various tenses. Let's see what the LEH tells you the usage, poly tree, the domain. Okay, let's see its application. Uh, this is the one that we use all the time. Let's look at my theological dictionary. Okay, didomi. And remember, this dictionary, called the New Testament uh, Dictionary, <coughs> Theological Dictionary, it researches the Greek word according to the usage of all the Greek philosophers and books and writing in Paul's time. So it's like, it would be like the dictionary of Paul's words. And of course, sometimes Paul takes a word and he adds more meaning to it. So it is the most, it's almost like the, the Webster's or Collins uh, dictionary uh, of our time. Like it takes all the usage that is there. So in this new theological dictionary, it will research like how is Didomi used by philosopher A, B, C, D, all the different philosophers. How is it used in book number one, two, three, four uh, of the ancient Greeks? And so it will give the best meaning possible. <coughs> Didomi, in accordance with the significance and the realistic character of the thought of love in the New Testament, that is as a gift and not merely a disposition. A disposition means like a benevolence, uh, an uh, attribute, but it's an actual impartation, a gift. <coughs> And um, so let's look at how the word occurs 
say it gives you the New Testament occurrence. But I'm interested in the site occurrences in different areas. And um, let's say Philo distinguishes between Dora or Dorsis on the one side. Uh, they debate about the value of things, of gift. See the word didomi in the normal usage of the Greek culture is use of the supreme. When I say Greek, it's not modern Greek. Modern Greek and ancient Greek is a world of a difference. Some words are still the same, like when we went to Greece, I realized that aptos is still bread and kapos is still fruit. Uh, so, but uh, uh, they have various, uh, various other uh, meanings that are there too. And, uh, like ancient King James. And you thought you knew the King James. You know the old King James, the English spell words are written differently also. It's very hard to read. I have one book like that called George Fox Journal. Oh, it's a long time to read those, those funny looking scribbles that don't look like English at all. So the same way between ancient Greek, uh, New Testament Greek and uh, modern Greek. So this is according to the New Testament ancient Greek. The meaning is its use of the supreme gifts of God. So it's something that is supernatural, spiritual, and it is a gift unto people. That's the word didomi. Uh, the root form is gift. A gift. You never realize it. See how far the word is put. Put, just put, just speaks about the action. But didomi emphasizes the action, the attribute, the disposition, and the grace part, which is a gift. And uh, so I want to emphasize the word put. The right should be a normal Greek word, grapho. Except they emphasize it with epigrapho. Now, to write it in their hearts, he uses the word uh, epigrapho, not just grapho. The normal word is just a grapho, which should be, uh, which is here, G-R-A-P-H-O, grapho. You don't need like E-P-I here, epsilon, pi, and iota. Uh, that epigrapho, so you don't need, you don't need the grapho part, uh, which would be enough to write, to say that I write. Like, I write grapho, and uh, you write graffete, and uh, so I don't need the epi. But they add the epi part. The epi part is added as a prefix to emphasize uh, that it is in contact. Like for example, if I say I write, you don't know what, how I write, what I write. If I describe, I write with a pen, different from writing with a pencil. I write with permanent ink, different. If I say I write upon a piece of paper, I write on the wall. You see, if I write upon something, and I write on something, and I write in something, it's different in the English. So they, they use the word I write upon, a P. That's why it says to inscribe. Not just write, it's into you inscribed physically and mentally uh, over thereon. And uh, so that's uh, the root word. Understanding these two root words that we're going to look at, didomi and epigrapho, we will read now the, this part of the New Testament. <coughs> For verse 10, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will didomi my laws in their mind. I will put it as a free gift into them. Law should be entole, not law, no man. Entole is commandment, no mos. Okay, no mos is a quite a normal usage for the law. That's fine. So I will give my laws into them. Isn't that a contrast? Because usually what is law and what is law versus grace? Works versus grace. But now, the ability to follow the law is gifted into you. That's the new covenant. 
and I will diddle me or give my loss into their mind. The word mind, as you all know, in this usage is Gaia Noia, the visual part of your mind. Remember, they could have chosen different Greek words, but they chose the visual part. To emphasize something, call visions. Because your Dido me has eyes. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Paul prayed that the eyes of your dianoia, your dianoia has eyes. It's the visual part. I emphasize again, God is putting and writing into your heart and in your mind. And the mind part is the dianoia or the visual part of your mind. So, let's read on. It says, I will put my laws in their, I will uh, give my laws into their dianoia and write them, inscribe them. Write is not a powerful word enough. The word inscribe is a more powerful word. I will inscribe. Inscribe is almost like uh, you actually scratch into the material, not just on the surface. Normal writing is a, a pigment ink on the surface. Inscribe in the English usage means like when you want to do the words, you dig up, you carve out the words. You actually put it into part of the material, the DNA of it. And uh, so you write them on your hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The result is. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none of his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. And he says, when he says a new covenant, it means the old was obsolete. Done away. Now, in chapter 8, he emphasized. He did me into their mind and he inscribed it in the heart. So here's the thing, put into the mind, write into the heart. We got that? Say amen. amen. Okay, now chapter 10. Chapter 10. Just want to make sure everyone gets this. He describes it in a different manner. But he reverses the process. And that's how the Holy Spirit sometimes uses the same scriptures and reverses to bring a revelation. In verse 15 and 16, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them. Let's see the word make. Okay. The item. Okay. The word make is to create a covenant, to make a covenant, uh, create a covenant with them after those days, says the Lord. Let's make sure that it's the same Greek word, okay? Put is still didomi, <coughs> mind is still dianoia, right is still epigrapho, yes, same Greek words. So, I will make covenant with them after those days, says the Lord. I will didomi my laws into their hearts. In their dianoia, I will epigrapho or inscribe them. And it adds their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Where there is remission of this, there is no longer an offering for sin. Then it says, Therefore, verse 19, we have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. Two different things. In two chapters, separated by one chapter, chapter 8, separated by chapter 9 and chapter 10. Chapter 8 says, Didomi in the mind, Epigrapho in the heart. Correct? Chapter 10 says, Didomi in the heart, Epigrapho in the mind. Why? Good question. Why? 
Why does it do that? It talks about processes. You know, process is very important. In the industrial world, having the right process to manufacture something is important. <coughs> and uh, then having the right ingredients is important. Uh, a process is important. Which is why everybody can go to the internet or buy a cookbook follow the exact quantity and that's supposedly one quality of ingredients and then they follow the instructions they mix everything and they cook still comes out different what's the problem the process we all got the same bible we all know the truth of meditation we know the truth of confession all of us do devotional life, all of us get up and pray, all of us visualize. We all got the same ingredients. I would assume it's the same. Your Bible, my Bible is the same. We got the same Holy Spirit. We got the same quality. Maybe the quantity might be different. But let's suppose if the quantity is the same then it's left to the process the process of what we do so I give a little illustration long ago uh, when I was in Malaysia I stayed with a family and their children were learning bakery in school they are learning bakery and uh, so when they learned bakery uh, they did a few times and uh, Three times the cake can use for playpen. It came out as hard as a rock. Uh, of course, they, they were just learning the lesson. They thought making cake is easy. Of course, they buy it off the shelf. But they got to take every other year and then mix it. Then after a few tries, uh, this family happened to know an expert chef who wrote a book. And so they consulted this person. And this person uh, says, okay, tell me what you did. And then he said, and what's the texture of the cake? Ha, <laughs> I tell you, if it, was, if it was rock cake, it was really rock. But it was not rock cake. It was supposed to be a, a nice soft cake. Uh, it was tough and hard. I mean, it would, would, would be one of those cakes that you want to chew on your birthday. Uh, so they consulted this chap. And then this, uh, she's a specialized cake maker too. Uh, so she said, okay, I know what's the problem. See, not, not bad. He said, your sugar was not fully melted. <gasps> then I didn't know myself that it must, it must, you know, sort of dissolve properly. If it's not dissolved properly, it's different. Now we all here in Singapore and Malaysia, we love this jam called Kaya, which is egg jam. It's egg, for those of you overseas who never tasted kaya, you should try it. Go to the Asian shop, you say K-A-Y-A, kaya. It is called egg jam. It's literally egg plus coconut. Mixed together. Oh yeah, and then they flavor it with the green pandan leaf. Makes it nicer. Some don't flavor it, so it's a yellow kaya. If they flavor it, pandan becomes a greenish kaya. And I like both. And when I was young, I used to watch my mother making kaya. And then I realized different people like different kaya. So she would be stirring it on the pot, on the stove, and all those things. And I, like, I actually like to eat the leftover at the bottom, and, uh, like a cake. And so, but uh, her style, which I realized was one of the Teochew styles, was uh, clumpy. And you know, it's a clumpy kaya. So it's very eggy. Then some people like what you call fluid kaya which is smooth and it's like uh, 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 very smooth it's like oil today if anyone you change oil in the car uh, they sell different types of oil especially you change yourself and oil is measured by viscosity viscosity is an English word that describes how fluid it is and then they, they invented what you call artificial oil uh, from the molecular level and uh, and that's the, sometimes the special oil they use for sports car. 
because the oil must flow nicely for all the pistons to run properly without burning. It's the oil that, that takes away the heat and smoothen all the metal parts that keep contact. Without oil, the metals will scrap and destroy one another. In the car will, you know, go to the, uh, will be a junkyard. So, the viscosity of the oil the, must be consistent and better. So, I say that um, uh, the same way with the kaya. Uh, I realize people have different preference kind of thing, some like in between instead. And why? Same eggs, same coconut milk come out different style of kaya. Uh, the process. So let's come down. We got the same word, we got the same meditation, and we're talking about visions and prayer. But I realize if people don't know the process, it doesn't work as well for them as those who know. Spiritual knowledge, like natural knowledge, empowers you. Today, we are in a society where knowledge makes millionaires. Long ago, thousand years ago, we live in a world or society, a thousand or two thousand years ago, we live in a society in a world where physical warrior and ability to fight were champions by the culture. Today, people admire braininess. Uh, they admire people who take that knowledge and make it successful and make money out of that. So our champions are different. Of course, there are still sports people that people admire, uh, but culture has changed. And the thing that makes money now is knowledge and, uh, and the process of things. The spiritual world, in the spiritual world, money has no value. In fact, as far as I know, when I saw the Lord Jesus, the thing that amazed me about our Lord Jesus when I see visions of his life, he never he won't want to touch money. Never. If people want to pay him money, he will look to his disciples, ask them to collect. It's, it's almost like you don't want to touch it. Money is invented by him. Money doesn't exist in heaven. And uh, so in the spiritual world, the currency is not money. The currency is love. And the other things that are more valuable than money, which will produce success and money on this earth if you walk correctly. Because when you obey all the Ten Commandments, then you're the head and not the tail. And all the Ten Commandments are obeyed by the law of love. So by logical conclusion, you realize that it still leads to the same result. Except that now you know the process. Because it says that no one could keep the Ten Commandments. So if in the Old Testament they could be the head and not the tail by keeping part of the commandments, how much more in the New? When through the love of God and through the ability of God, we keep all His commandments. The process, very important. Chapter 8 and chapter 10 of Hebrews is talking also of the process. See, when we talk about visualizing and prayer, many people begin to try to visualize on their own strength. And what happens if you visualize something that is not God's will? God will never answer any prayers not in line with His will. And the best, perfect will. A minimum, permissive will. But still within the context of His will. God will not answer a prayer that is not in line with His will. It will be like a robber visualizing how to rob 10 banks and coming to all night prayer and fasting. We think it will work. It will come from work. All the energy is expended and wasted. Of course, nothing is wasted, right? So God will use all the energy to try to convert him and make him a good man. Of course, he will be kicking himself, wondering why the prayer not answered. Instead, everything that God answered was trying to make him a good man. Because God doesn't always answer according to what we pray, especially with what we pray is not in line with His will. 
So the first, when you mix visualization and prayer and you're entering into the dimension of God to walk effectively, say, which part of us is conscious? In practical terms, you are conscious of your mind and your heart. All through the Old Testament, God has even said in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So literally, He knows that we have two consciousness. Consciousness of the heart and consciousness of the mind. Even in the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, it says, let the peace of God garrison your heart and your mind. Two places. Then when you watch the lives of different people, let's say the Apostle Peter in the New Testament, there are many times when his heart was right. In fact, his heart was right all the time. But his mind can be off key. See, when he tried to stop Jesus from going to the cross after Jesus blessed him for saying that he is the Christ the Messiah and the first one to confess boldly in Matthew chapter 16, and then Jesus revealed that the Messiah must suffer and die, Peter revealed Jesus. He had a good heart. His motive was he didn't want Jesus to die. Good, right? But his mind was wrong. His methods were wrong. Uh, he think the wrong thing. So you see, there is a di uh, you know there is a uh, dichotomy between the mind and the heart. The two consciousness. Jesus himself, though perfect, shows us the difference that the sometimes the two being taking on sin nature or like the likeness of sin. It shows sometimes things like he says that uh, his spirit is troubled. That is his heart. Or sometimes he says his soul is troubled. And then especially in the encounter in Lazarus, you see many things. And then after Jesus talked nicely, then on the way to the tomb, he wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, John 11, 35. Jesus wept two words. Something was happening in his soul and he let it flow. The difference was, Jesus could feel the difference between his mind and his heart, but it did not affect him. He knew how to let the heart rule. Here's the thing. Every time when your head and your heart fight, Follow your heart. Never follow your head. Your heart is always right. Scripture for that, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Didn't Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Lean not on your own understanding. So there is these two different heart and the mind. Now, Hebrews chapter 8 and 10 speaks about the dynamia, which is the visual part. When God puts or gives something into you, everything that God does, his, He writes, in the spiritual world, if you write something, it becomes a picture. Of course, there are words. Then when you look at the words, the words can become a story or picture. Then in, when you open a book and read, not only can you read, but you actually can see the story like a video, uh, video player. So that's the reality of things in the spirit. Taking that down to understand that dimension into these words, when the Bible says God right, it is Him putting and slowly inscribing visions into us. Okay, remember, everything is about visions. When He write, it will become vision. To support that, I also use our English analogy. Words paint pictures. At the end of the day, the words paint pictures. So pictures is the end result. 
And so what God is doing is actually putting the vision. I got to change your definition, your mind to understand Hebrews A and that. First, look at the word epigrapho. It is not just grapho. It's inscribing something. Inscribing something. We all know that we have a DNA within us that's programmed. When you look at the double strands of the DNA, you cannot see any picture. You can only see the beautiful double strand. But inside each DNA is forming a picture of a human being. It's not forming an elephant, otherwise you become like an elephant. It's not becoming a tall giraffe, otherwise your neck will grow like a tall giraffe. Inside the DNA is a picture of what a human being is. And it's shooting chemicals to tell your body produce this shape and this image. But when you look at it, you cannot see the image. But within each little tiny molecule was pointing to the image and finding its place in the image. Telling every other cell and chemical, follow this image. That's what DNA does. It's a program to tell all chemicals and all calcium and all molecules to follow the shape and create a human being. In the end, it's a picture. So in the same way, understand that the word epigrapho means he is slowly, line by line, precept by precept, writing and inscribing a picture. Slowly. That's what he's doing. Then the other process, didomi, is to give you with a gift, G-I-F-T, gift you with a full vision instead of one by one. When you look at both as visions, then you have a different understanding. Looking at Hebrews 8, God says, He will dido me a vision into our mind and epigrapho, slowly build another vision in our heart. Then Hebrews 10, he puts the vision into our heart. Dido me. And then he now writes a vision in our mind, epigrapho. So the process is a give vision to the mind and a slowly developing vision in your heart. And then the second process, which is a give vision into your heart and a writing of vision in your mind. Here is my question finally. Which comes first? Here, then right, or here, then right. Very easy question, right? right? Which comes first? Yes? I also quiet. You have been taught this scripture many times, but not from the visions and prayers that I mentioned. Remember, when you look at everything as a vision, and it comes out differently. So tell me, so that you can understand what's happening every time we have visions and prayers. Guess, take a guess, wrong, never mind. Uh, where's my Alex? Oh, your thinking cap is on. <laughs> You're gonna. Yes? Okay, so we have to tell which is first, which is second. Yeah. Okay, good point. Are you all any other difference? Yes? 
your mind forms a picture. Yes. So the the heart. The heart. Uh, the heart will be the later part because the heart, the passion comes from the heart. When it, when your mind forms a picture and you start dropping your heart, the definitely I put it high definition because it's really passionate. So okay. So let me hear. You're saying that it comes to the mind, it slowly builds into the heart. Okay. Yes. Which part we talking about? The spirit mind, soul mind, or the inner different minds, right? Yes. Spirit and body. So yeah. We ignore the body. Body is just brain spirit, and body. Is the mind so soul mind it's a soul spirit? mind versus the spirit mind. Spirit is always the heart. Because the always been what focus on the spirit. Spirit. Receiving the spirit first, and then one has to receive the one. Okay. So he is taking the exact opposite position, which I think these are the three positions you can take. He can either take the position of Alex and say, sometimes it's this one, sometimes it's that one. Sometimes heart first, then mind, sometimes mind first, then heart. Uh, yep, he's saying uh, mind, and then takes time to describe to the heart. Uh, Jehuda is saying because heart is spirit, so spirit first and then the mind. Let me give you some scriptures. Scriptures, right? Right. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Give some scriptures before I answer the question. It says, verse 6. It is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this one looked like Jehuda's version. Shine in the heart first, then the mind slowly renew. Right? It ties with Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Correct? Then, you have Romans chapter 17. Romans chapter 17, sorry, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Onwards. Romans 10, 17. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, the sound has gone out to all the world, and it was to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel know? And then he goes on to tell. Uh, Things in the early things like uh, these words here. Moses writes about the righteousness which of the law, the man who does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. And that is what does it say? The word is near you. In your mouth in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. If you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and then believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you are saved. Look, your soul must respond. Then only you can get into the heart. So that is the Brother Yang's version. So I have given you two different scriptures. One that emphasizes, obviously, it must something must hit your mind first before it gets into the heart. But at the same time, something must get into the heart before it comes out from you. So that is the question that we ask. Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10. And Alex's position is sometimes this first, sometimes this first, sometimes this first, sometimes this first, sometimes this first.
Yes. Through my right, through my mind, through uh, uh, and he is hearing with his soul first in English language yes. before it gets into the heart. So it's a two stage. Yes. You know what the correct answer is? Ram roll. Okay, no The correct answer. That's why it's so confusing. Is that both processes are taking that taking place at the same time. If you read Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, he was not emphasizing one before the other. He was speaking as if both are a reality. And he happened to bring the other reality and, and speak about the other reality in Hebrews 10, as opposed to the other reality in Hebrews 8. Because both are two realities that are taking place at the same time. Which is an interesting thing. If I were to ask you, um, is your heart receiving blood or giving up blood? You have to answer both. Correct. If I were to say, as far as your lungs are concerned, it's breathing all the time. But each time you breathe, you might say when you breathe in, it sucks oxygen. When you breathe out, it gives out carbon dioxide. But that is your consciousness. Inside it, everything has to be taking place at the same time. So, here is the reality. Both are taking place at the same time. What God wants to do is there are some things that, are, that belong to the spirit that must begin in your spirit. So God has put some things in your mind, some visions in your mind, and at the same time there are some visions, the dead one is a gift. Then some he is inscribing. And both processes have to be there. Then in your heart, he immediately puts like the glory, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in your heart. But the other things he has to inscribe. Both processes are taking place. Now, the ability to switch in your consciousness between both processes will help you. While you switch between them, you never create your own vision. Sometimes, you're conscious of the vision of the heart. And sometimes you're conscious of the visions in your mind. But this is what's happening. They speak two different languages. The frequency of the soul and the frequency of the spirit are two different frequencies. But here's a secret. Okay, so I do a bit of drawing now. Right? You're trying to imagine what it's like. So let me visualize it for you. Try to do a bit of drawing here. Let's see what's our last drawing. Oh, okay. Is that the last one? Yeah, that's the last one. Okay. Now let's assume this is your soul or your mind. And this is your spirit or your heart. Okay. I have to use colors to make it effective. There are some visions that is a didomi into your heart. So God places it on your inside. And there are some uh, didomi Remember, because the Didomi vision that God placed in your mind. There we have it. Then, as we know, there are some things that God is writing in your mind. Correct? Right? Something God writing in your heart. Now, let me see if I get rid of that. Okay. I try to use a different color. So, he didomi it into your mind. So that's my grip deed. 
little me inside. Now, what is he writing into the heart here? And what's happening? Remember, the two must be synchronized to mirror. There are some things that God is writing. Ta da, ta da, ta da. Right? He's still writing. I am online. Reset or preset. Then there are some things God is writing here. Ta da, ta da, ta da. Into your heart. And then both processes are happening at the same time. Now, what is also happening? <laughs> is that everything that is in the heart must also synchronize here and create a mirror image here and what is in the mind also must synchronize here and create an image here and then the two are exact mirrors see the problem with being led by the spirit is it the leading part must be interpreted by your soul when you pray in tongues your mind is unfruitful Paul says that 1 Corinthians 14 Verse 14 and 15. And then he does both processes. Having this drawing, I'll come back to it again. And oops, the other way around. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 and 15, he says, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit is praying. But my understanding is unfruitful. Not too good. Because how transformed you are will also depend on the transformation of your soul. Your spirit can be super transformed, but your soul is ee, just a little bit. Nothing comes out. In fact, it's not possible to have your spirit really bigly transformed if your soul is not transformed. There is what I call an optimum. It's like them waiting for each other. It's like walking. You know, when you walk, both your legs must be as strong. If one leg is weaker than the other, you will end up. If let's say your, your right leg is weaker than the other, and you have to quickly go to your left leg, because you cannot put the weight too long. Can you see that? Or, you know, and the opposite is true. If your left leg is weaker than your right leg, then you don't have to put too much and too long to hold it, you quickly move to the other leg. In order to walk properly, both legs must have equal strength. In the same way, the development of your spirit depends on the development in your soul. The development in your soul depends on the development of your spirit. And sometimes you have concentration on one because you're moving forward. To walk and to move forward, sometimes you need all your right leg to go forward. But it's only one leg. But while the right leg is going forward, do you notice? You're depending on your left leg to carry your weight. And then, after that, you depend on your right leg to take all the weight while your left leg is moving forward. You need both legs of equal strength. And in fact, they measure walking versus running. When you run, it is different. At some point, both legs are in the air. Because the movement are so fast. But when you walk, and this is the, the legal status for checking whether a walkathon is not a, a, is not a marathon by seeing that they must have one leg on the ground all the time. Except they're doing so fast that their, their hip really swings, which I cannot do because I'm not a walk -a person. And uh, have you seen how people walk walk -a Oh, they really swing. 
Why do they say? Because they want to take the maximum. The maximum. They don't want to, to you know, when, when your leg takes long and you rest, you really lose momentum. So what they're doing is playing with momentum. So as fast as possible, while this one, the momentum is still flowing, you flow into the other one. That's how they walk walk a talk. My scientific analysis, right? Based on the law of physics. And uh, so you, you always tap on momentum. When you drive a car to say petrol, it depends. Do you know the same distance driven by two different people, or uh, besides speed and all that, can differ in your consumption of petrol? If you're a heavy user, that means red light coming, you still speak and then you break then you speak then you break your consumption of petrol at the end of the month is more than the other guy. So the other guy use the accelerator like bread punching and eggshell. Only what is necessary. So at the end of one month you say, Huh? I use half a tank. You you use full tank. Huh? Because one presses the accelerator like an eggshell to consume. Now, every one of us got our driving styles based on your character. But all of us know when you're very low on petrol and you're on an outstation trip and you look at a petrol gauge, say, ah, forgot to fill up full tank as it is. And then, of course, nowadays you've got measurement to, to tell you approximately how many more kilometers you can last, which is a help. But long ago, when you don't have that, you look at the thing, wow, nearly empty. And you know there's a reserve tank also. Uh, but then, even then, you take no risk. You really press it like an, uh, pressing an eggshell, your accelerator. Uh, whereas when the tank is full, you just go, zzz, you know? And, and, you, and you, you, a lot of energy is producing the momentum. And once you get the momentum, then you cruise on the momentum. That is why your power consumption is less on fourth and fifth gear than it is on first gear. You have two measurements in the car. One is a speedometer that tells you the speed. The other is the tachometer that tells you the speed of your engine, how heavy your engine is pumping and how much energy. So when you're on first gear starting, the tachometer goes but your speed is very low. And then as you take second gear, third gear, fourth gear, auto automatic change or manual change, by the time you hit fourth and fifth gear on the highway, your tachometer goes down. Engine speed. That means your petrol consumption. Your petrol consumption is not just based on your, your speedometer. Whereas your speedometer is high on fifth gear, but your tachometer is low. And it's your tachometer that tells you how much petrol you're consuming, how much fuel you're burning to push your car. And consumption is so important that every airline pilot must check the weight of the airplane and how much fuel he has. It's a basic law. You cannot fly and then suddenly halfway over the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean don't have enough fuel. And they must carry just enough fuel to land plus a little bit more in case there's a delay. And, uh, and then nowadays, because uh, money is so important and airlines are squeezed, they sometimes don't want to carry full tank. Because a full tank might be the weight of another tank passenger, which means they consume more. And so if it's a short distance, they might just carry enough fuel. So that they save the weight of tank passengers uh, and the and, and, and the fuel costs money. The most expensive thing when you own a plane uh, and a boat is the fuel consumption. You ask any boat owner who own a yacht. And fuel, and of course, besides that, for airplanes, is the parking cost. Even if you're not flying, you park somewhere, it costs you money. <laughs> Could be by the millions. Uh, so we have that. There is your spirit, there is your soul. To move forward, your spirit can go forward only so much. There's no way you can go that much 
and you're so spiritual and your soul is so bodo. Use the Malay word for idiotic. No way. He has to catch up. And uh, then there are some things when your soul needs to know before your spirit can catch up. Because the, the spirit read, read that much, but your soul still didn't grow. So it's holding back your spirit. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians here. He says, in verse 14, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is untruthful. What is the conclusion there? Yes, Paul, what is the conclusion? Is he helping us answer this question? I will do both. I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding. He will do both. This is the conclusion. He will do both to grow. When you look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, there is no way you can discover God's will in your life and make a proper decision without your mind being renewed. No matter how spiritual you are. Look at verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove or test what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? Look at verse 2. Isn't it very clear that until your mind is renewed, you cannot know God's will? Your spirit might want to do something, but your soul has no renewal, no transformation, no knowledge, and it will hold back your spirit. It's like the spirit is encrusted by the soul. And cannot do anything. Sometimes when you talk to people in the spirit, I could see and a person spirit talk to me, and then their spirit will say, they just cannot get across to their soul. And they never progress spiritually. Because the spirit knows something and the spirit wants to do something, but the soul is so insensitive, doesn't even know what's going on in the spirit. And here's the thing: your soul must know what's going on in your spirit. Your spirit must know what is going on in your soul. Otherwise, you cannot walk with God. Because the Lord says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy soul, and all thy strength. Which is his good strength, not your strength. God's energy. So, even how can you even obey the first commandment if your soul is not with you? Right? You cannot even obey. Oh, oh, you want, uh, at least one verse, right, for the commandment. Easy to find. Uh, love the Lord thy God. Okay. In many places, the Lord. Oh, let's well, just type first commandment. Yeah, easy to find. First and Tole and you jump straight to the New Testament. And anyone will do first commandment. I should have put the word first of the commandments. And um, oops, 15 more results. No wonder I didn't see it. Just 11 more results and I didn't. And they could hide it inside. Okay, love the Lord thy God, first commandment. Here's the 12. Is it chapter 12? Yeah, chapter 12. Okay, the scribes came and said, Which is the first commandment? And Jesus says, This is Mark. Yeah, it's Mark in the 16 chapters. Uh, it was 29. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God and the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, with all your strength. The second commandment is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first commandment got four parts. Everyone just say, love God. Eh, eh. Eh, eh. Love God with all your heart. Everyone loves God. Everyone say, I love you Lord, but half your heart. And maybe not even with their soul. Maybe not with all their strength. So, four parts to loving God. With all your heart, all your mind, all, all your soul, which includes your emotions and your will, that means you must choose Him 100% of the time, with all your mind, with all your strength. So suddenly, Hebrews 8 and 10 has a different picture. And we realize the synchronization. Now, back to the picture. I hope I've the picture. Here is it. We realize that the spirit and the soul must help each other to move forward, to grow. It is God who created the soul. And here's the thing. The soul is so valuable, Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The soul is so important that we talk about believing to the saving of the soul. The soul is so important and the reason why you came to planet Earth is to develop your soul. If we didn't want to develop our soul, which is the sense of our individuality, we could stay as spirit beings. Why come to the earth and endanger ourselves? The soul is part of what we bring out to coming to this planet Earth, the New Jerusalem. So it's an important component that we're trying to develop. For God needs a a race of creatures and beings who have a fully developed spirit and a fully developed soul. In <coughs> heaven, there are many, many types of creatures. I've seen all kinds of creatures and, and they are gigantic beings who are so developed in the spirit, but they hardly have any soul. All their consciousness is consciousness of God with very little consciousness of themselves. They have no ability to be fully conscious of themselves because fully conscious of yourself takes a soul development. That's huge. And so God was going to create a creature who has what you call, you know, if there's a button, you know, uh, you know now we have buttons that go up and down when you're doing, uh, what I call it, balancing. So you put more bass or more treble or all the different ranges. So when God was going to create a creature where he pushed the soul consciousness all to the limit, Ooh! that creature is Adam and Eve with that consciousness. That's why angelic consciousness and human consciousness are different. You know why angels can stay very long in a place for one billion years and they're proud of the fact that they've been instructed to stay there? Because the Bible says angels are ministering spirits. Their spirit consciousness is developed. But you put a human being there, even in its perfect state, after a million years, uh, he will start thinking of uh, any other interesting thing to do. Which is why in the millennium, there is a rebellion. Why a rebellion? After 1,000 years, with Christ visible, correct? In a millennium, Christ is on earth. His throne is there. You could go and say, hello Jesus. His blood has washed all of us. We are perfect creatures in a millennium. Remember Jesus came to build his throne. Antichrist defeated. Satan bound for a thousand years. No evil. All evil pushed away. The only evil left that is there is Satan. All the others are in the lake of fire. 
So why at the end of a thousand years does a group of humans deceived by perfect humans deceived by Satan? Because humans like to see a different change. But Satan can never do that anymore to the fallen angel. Humans have a soul capacity beyond all other creatures. And here's the thing. Humans also have the spirit capacity. If we didn't come, we would be like the angels. Even Jesus said, when they come and test him with the seven brothers and one poor woman who lived longer than the seven brothers, remember the story? And because they were the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. So that parable, that, that one might not even be a true story. It, it was concocted by them in order to test Jesus and ask him this question. Since this woman had married all seven brothers, one by one, not all at the same time, but each one died until the youngest left, and then the youngest died. Well, this woman lived so long. I don't know if she lived so long, or all the husbands died very fast after they married her. So you can imagine the last one who married her would be dragged, kicking and screaming, because he think for a funeral. Right, you're going to die soon, because all his six brothers died. So, in the end, they said, this woman also died. And they posed him the question, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? The trick question. Is it number, brother number one or brother number six or number seven? And Jesus says, you have no understanding of all this thing. And Jesus said, in the resurrection, they are like the angels of God in heaven. They do not marry nor are given in marriage. Now the doctrine of the soulmate is different. The doctrine of the soulmate is not just about marriage. You see, the spiritual understanding of soulmate has nothing to do with marriage. You know why? Marriage is only a small part of the earth. So your marriage can survive even if you're not soulmates. I remember I said that. Huh? So don't everyone look. You're not my soulmate, then divorce. I never say that. Who say that? Some idiot put those words in my mouth. I never say that. I never say that even in my book. Some idiot say I say that. I never say that. The assumption, you only hear what you want to hear. So many, you can't, I mean, life is so short on earth. How long you know, can be people who are so different can survive if they, you know, even if they sign a peace treaty. One can be Palestinian and one like, one can be an Israelite, and then once in a while they shoot missiles at each other and still can live happily ever after. Not quite so, right? And survive on the earth. I never said that. I never said that you do need to find a soulmate in order to get married. I never said those words. In all my teaching on soulmate, I say soulmate teaching is for the millennium. Didn't you hear it? You see, it's like people misquoting Jesus. I say the reason for the soulmate doctrine is for the millennium and for a high level of completion in the dimension of the spirit so that when God created Adam, he was one gender. And God split it into male and female. So there is a place in God where a certain level of perfection is required and then the two soulmates become one being. That's why they're called soulmates. Their souls are half of each other. And I can show from the Bible that soulmates exist because if soulmates can exist between Jonathan and David, it implies that it can even more exist because Adam was split into male and female. We all like to use words like 
uh, they are hundred percent of each other, but that's a misnomer in mathematics. Correct? When you use math, you cannot say that. Because hundred percent is the whole. Chop into two is fifty percent. So technically, Adam and Eve are fifty percent of each other. It takes both to become hundred percent. That is the soulmate doctrine. It has to do with the ability to combine to become one being, which is not possible on earth. So those who are able to find their soulmate, or some will find it in the next life, will develop the ability where there are certain places and certain things they need to, to enter into or, or have the energy, and they can become one being and function like one being. It has nothing to do with life on earth. Life with earth. I mean, how much of my teaching is just for life on earth? All my teaching has always been to prepare you to meet the throne of God and the face of God in the presence of God. And just because people have no understanding, and as usual, you only hear what you want to hear from your perspective. I can teach about the faith to enter the fullness of the throne room and those who are financially greedy will only hear it how to get more finances people hear what it but hear the teaching carefully read the book carefully just like they misquoted jesus and said oh jesus said he's going to destroy this temple no he was talking about his body the temple misquotation misunderstanding carnality so, let's get back to the topic on this area where I talk about the spirit and the soul. The spirit and the soul are to be able to be fully developed. We came to the planet Earth to develop our soul. To develop our soul. And when our soul grows spiritualized as our spirit, we would have the ability to function like our Lord Jesus Christ on the earth with full understanding of God. So that's the diagram that we have. One is soul and spirit, and you can see the interchange of writing. Practical application now. And uh, before we go to prayer, let's go into uh, John, Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15, and 16. John 14, 15, and 16. Now, I summarize where we have led you. We started with Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10, where God, the word put, the laws into our mind, the word put is the word didomi, which is to give into you. Remember, it's a gift. So God gives the gift of visions into your diagnosis, in your mind. In Hebrews 8, and he writes them in your heart. Chapter 10. He, he gives it into your heart and he writes them into your mind. And he said, both are happening at the same time. Let's say the thumb is the giving and the fingers are the writing. So both are happening at the same time. Your soul, your spirit, they're happening at the same time. That is why sometimes when you pray, you feel that you tap on certain, certain visions are in your heart. And you tap on that, it's, you could just easily see those things. Because it's already all full inside you. And it's like bubbling out through you. And then some things are in your soul. It bubbles up. And you don't even try. But then there are other things you've got to struggle to write it or build a picture. Both in your heart and in your mind. Can you see? Both processes are taking care. And what we need to do when we pray is this. Since the putting is a gift, you know me? Focus on the visions God has completed. Do not disturb a painter while the painting is not complete. Rule of thumb. Do not disturb an author when he hasn't finished writing whatever book. Read the book after it's finished. 
Do not disturb a preacher when he's halfway describing something because the other half might make the clarity, the rule of thumb. Then when the thing is finished, then you can look at the whole picture, analyze the thing. So the rule of thumb is know which part of the visions God has given you are in your heart that are the didomi ones. Locate the didomi visions in your heart and in your mind. Locate them. They are gifts. Remember we studied the word didomi? They are gifts. Then the ones that are being written or epigrapho, being inscribed, learn how to yield to its description. So then your next question is, how? Uh, so, I give you John 14, 15, 16 as application. John 14, 15, 16 is this. Now, let me illustrate uh, with Jehuda. He put down the thing, it come up a while, and he got to... Okay. Let's say that I'm using his back to write. Okay? If he stays still, I can write, correct? Now, you try to keep moving and don't stay in one spot at the same time. Up and down, up and down, whatever. You know? Ah, this is not great. Now, make it a bit bend up. See? Can you see how hard it is to write? Can you see? Thank you. Can you see how it is to write? Can you see? Thank you. It is hard to write when you're not still. Correct? So John 14, 15, 16, there are keys to this. Since the Didomi ones, the Didomi visions in your heart and your mind, is a full load. No writing needed. The ones that need to be written are the hard ones, correct? So you must always enter a rest where you're still and then God can write to you. John 14, we are at rest and we allow God to finish His writing. John 14 is God doing something to us in us. The whole of John chapter 14. First, you must be still. Peace, be still. And he talked about peace. Let not your heart be troubled. Because your heart is troubled, how to write? Correct? Look at John 14 verse 1. Be at rest. Enter the rest and you will cease from your own works. Like just now, very hard to write on Jehuda when you're running all over the place, correct? You must cease from your own works, then, God can, then God's works can start. As long as you want to do your thing, God will step back. Okay, go. Which is also the principle on saving a drowning man. Do you know if a drowning man is struggling and fighting, you cannot jump in yet because you might be pulling. Even if you're an expert swimmer. Unless the person, of course, we all most of the time jump but then you've got to be careful or instruct the person not to struggle. The person must rely fully on you. Then you can save the person and swim, carry the person. But if the person, you're, you're coming to, to, to save the person, the person pull your head in, pull your bone drop. It is important that that person be at peace. Enter the rest. God will not interrupt us if you want to do your own thing. Lesson to that, you got 66 books of that. Or rather, since the book of Revelation is not much, and that, but you talk about all the wrong people or so. You got in the Bible stories of humans who want to go their own way, do their own thing. You think God wants to interrupt? Free will, but correct? It's a free will, free will, God give free will. Okay, you want to use your soul for evil, go. Don't go ahead. Choose what you want to do. And God will only come in when the words are 
be still and know that I'm God. When we invite Him. Right now, Jesus Christ has died for all the whole planet and every human being on this earth. Why cannot He come on some lives? Because some lives refuse to have Jesus. Some lives don't believe Jesus exists. Some people do not acknowledge that He is God. Some believe He's just a man. And then some don't believe in the existence of God. The humans don't accept. But did Christ die for their sins? Yes. Did Christ wash all their blood? Yes. But they haven't accepted. So there's no benefit to them. They want to go their own way, do their own thing. So the Father says, fine. It's a free choice. He, although it hurts him, it grieves him, he must let the freedom be exercised. And until a human cries out to God. Sometimes God is so patient that the tiniest cries of an atheist, help! God still help. But He waits for humans to call on Him, to invite Him into their life, which is John 14. And He says unto them, If you had known Me in verse 7, you had known the Father. Verse 8, show us the Father. And he says, have I been so long with you, Philip? You have not known me? And then he talks about all those things. Then he says, about believing in him. And this is the process. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because in either sees him, none knows him. But you know him. And he, is, he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. You see the words? I will come to you. Remember what I say in John 14? He, he, he does something to us and in us. We are being inscribed as a state of rest. Then he says, a little while longer the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, you in me. He who is my commandment and keep them is he who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and manifest myself to him. See, whole of John chapter 14, he does it to us. Which is in line with 2 uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. It says, we are his workmanship. We must become his workmanship. He's working in us. He's working into us. So we must be there. But like Paul says, Romans 12 verse 1, present. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Your body is not running all over. Your body is presented. You know what is a sacrifice in the Old Testament? A dead sacrifice. The animal cannot move anymore. Dead. But here in Roman child was one a living sacrifice. That means can run away. But Paul said, no, no, don't run away. Present as if you died in Christ. Surrender to God. That's you presenting yourself. God has to work in us first before He works through us. And part of the working in us and to us is His manifestation in us. He's building Himself into us. We are His workmanship. Allow Him to build Himself into you and that is the writing of the visions in your heart and in your mind. Since both are going on at the same time. And then you say, how, how to be still? You know, uh, sometimes very painful when He's doing all the writing. It's like pruning. Focus on, rest upon the visions He has already given. They're already completed. So you can keep focused on enjoy what He has already shown you. That's why when the Holy Spirit comes, He gives you visions and dreams. So, enjoy what He has completed. And isn't that what life is? You know the problem with many people, and you know why sometimes rebellion takes place. People have lost thankfulness and gratitude. We can always thank God for something. Even if you've got no money in your pocket, you thank God you still can breathe. You still got two arms, two legs, still can work. 
thank God for good health. Thank God that you're in a country that has the freedom you can't put. Sometimes people want to work, so no place. Thank God that you are a free man or free woman and you're not a slave. There are a thousand ways. If you look for things to thank God, you will find something to thank God. Thankful people are not rebellious people. The most important thing is to learn to have a heart of thanksgiving, gratitude. You do not find someone who says, I'm so in love with God, I'm so thankful to God for everything. I thank God for everything. I, I'm so in gratitude, rebelling. It is people who become ungrateful, unthankful, that rebel. Because you know why? When you're thankful to God, you become thankful for people. You're thankful for leaders, whether they are flawed or not flawed. You're thankful for your, your spouse, the people around you. Right? When husbands and wives are no more thankful of each other, that's when they will split. And it's not easy to carry on a relationship when one side is not thankful anymore. They're not looking for things to thank. They're looking for things to shoot. Thankfulness and gratitude are what can make us one. And the most important New Testament principle is thanksgiving. People forgot to wake up every day and every uh, morning, noon and night to be thankful. And here's the thing. Let's say I'm talking to Jehuda. As I'm talking to her, as my heart, in my heart is thankful for who he is. Thankful for the friendship. Thankful for all the things that we have with each other. Do you think I will do wrong thing against him? No way, man. So before rebellion is the absence of gratefulness and thankfulness. That goes out the door first. Sometimes you go out the door long ago. So long, like long time ago in Bethlehem, but not so nice a song. So, it gone up, and then, you know what replaced thankful, uh, unthankfulness and ungratefulness? Uh, thank, what replaced thankfulness and gratefulness? Complaints. Dissatisfaction. Unhappiness. Seeping anger. You can never be angry at a person and be thankful at the same time. <coughs> Try it. Not easy. Anger makes you unthankful. Then finally, your anger cools down and you begin to thank God for the person. As you begin to thank God for the person, you begin to see the good things in the person. And when you see the good things of the person, you try to bring forth the good things and help with the bad things. That is the power of thankfulness, which is important in the Bible. So God has to work into us first to create into each one of us things or be focused on vision. There are some visions in your heart, in your mind, which is already dear to me, gifted. Be thankful. You know, people always want more. People who are poor, they want to be middle class. People who are middle class, they want to be like the richy rich. People who are the richy rich, they want to be top of the dock, the richest of the richest. Never satisfied. And that kind of attitude will make an unthankful person. And as a result, they never at rest. Keeping up with the Joneses all the time. The only way forward in Christianity is always a walk of joy and peace. If you go only, you know, uh, uh, $10 in your pocket, you're thankful for the $10. And instead of wishing you have $100, you can exercise faith for $100, but you're thankful for the $10, and then you, you, when you have to eat that day, you will only look for food within your budget, and then uh, $10 doesn't, you know, you still can get quite a few things in Singapore, you know, like 2 $3, because you've got to stretch your dollar. And then here you are with the... Uh, your one-time noodle with a few pieces of char siu or chicken 
and you say, thank you, Lord. You're so thankful you could sing an entire hymn to God. Together with Handel's Messiah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Over oh, one plate or one tongue. The other guy who is not thankful, keep complaining. And you have $10. Mm -hmm. And you keep looking at the thing that uh, maybe uh, that cost fifteen dollars, and wish he has it, and say, "Hey, young God, why don't you, why don't you give me this?" Oh, and everything. Well, the other guy is already enjoying his handles, Messiah. You are singing the song of complaint. Do you know this life is not about how much money you have, or what kind of house you have, or how rich or poor you are, or how educated you are? Or how high the social status you are. Do you know what this life is about? This life is about making use of time. Because time is spread equally to all humans. Be thankful that you got the same 24 hours as Bill Gates. Now here's the difference. I will make that 24 hours... 24 hours of beautiful love and worship to God. And let's not use biggest thing, let's use another rich guy. The other rich guy had 24 hours. He spends 23 of his, because he has uh, sleeplessness, so never sleep to sleep. He spent 23 of his 24 hours worrying about everything. And maybe one hour just enjoy what he had. That one day passes. My 24 hours is more valuable than his. Because in heaven, my 24 hours gets to be recorded as something that's so pleasing to God. His 24 hours, 23 are lost. Of the one hour, there were a few minutes that he pondered and was grateful for the natural world, not even to God. But God so merciful, he even recorded that. Romans chapter 1, what happened to those guys? They were unthankful for creation. So this life is not just about money, social status, social status or position or ministry or power. This life is about how you use every minute and every hour to worship God and to be thankful. If there's one secret I want to give to you, that is the one. Remember how many times I say, my first call is to worship God. Above apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, above being a, the voice that cry, I mean, above everything else, my first call is to be a worshiper. And so, if that is the view of life, if I have only $10, let's say, for three days, and let's say the supply not coming in yet, then for three days, it is a test for me that whether I still can worship God when I have $10 spread over three days. Easy, two days fast, one day, eat vegetarian, with some fruit juice. Now, the test was how I used my time. The other guy might have $1,000 over three days and waste the money on gambling, drinking, socializing. At the end of the day, I gained the three days, he lost the three days. See, this life is not about money. We were given the gift of life. Money you spend, and if you spend on the right thing, you can earn and put it back and get it back. But when you lose time, you lost it. When you lost something spiritual, you lose it. Which is why I always encourage people, learn to be thankful to God and thankful for people. When you start looking at the bad things in other people, you will only make yourself miserable. Do you know what one of the tests is? To see whether you're thankful in the midst of a crowd or unthankful people. That's also a test. Then, 
the thankfulness that you gain is greater than the thankfulness for what? Let's say you're the one white sheep with 99 black sheep. Unusual phenomena, but it can happen if you're Jacob's flock. All speckled and spotted. And let's say the rest of the sheep never give thanks, all complaining. So it's a challenge to give thanks, but you still give thanks. And then there's the one white sheep with 99 other white sheep, all quite quiet, all worshipping God. Not much of a test to thank, thank, thank God. I tell you, this one white sheep in the midst of 99 got more reward. Because it was harder to give thanks. Every time you give thanks, they all stare at you like want to shoot an arrow or kill him or knife him and stab him in the back. This life is about how we use our time. Remember, the next time you don't have a job yet, the job will come. The next time you don't have enough money yet, don't worry. The next time you go through a test, remember, it's what you make use of that time while you're in that situation. Because situations will always change. Those who know and love their God will know this. There are times when Job lost everything. But there was a test. When that time was over, he had more than everybody else. You just have to be faithful in your time. There will be valleys, there will be mountains. There will be deserts, there will be oases. But whether you're in oasis or in a desert, whether you're on the valley, in a valley or on a high mountain, whether you're in the stormy sea or you're sailing across a smooth lake, the most important thing is you're immune to the circumstances. You're always a thanksgiver to God. Then you pass the test. Understand what this life is about. Because circumstances change. The richest man in the world today will be the paupers of tomorrow. And we who might not seem to have enough, we will be the richest people on planet Earth in Isaiah 60. So to have or not to have, that is not the question. The question is whether you're in God or not in God. And so, chapter 14, let God work good things into us. Then you pass the test. And then in chapter 15, God works through you. In chapter 14, the most important thing is to be a rest for God to work in you and on you and to you. In chapter 15, God now works through you. And when God works through you, the most important thing is fruit. Then He knows it succeeds in you. He says in John 15 verse 1 and 2, I am the true vine and my Father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, it takes away. That means you cannot produce. Being able to produce fruit is a criteria to enter the second level of relationship with you. See, there are three levels of relationship. This second level, I don't think I've got a chance to talk about the third level, I'll talk about it in the next Friday, but different levels of relationship with God. Some people relate to God in the first level. God manifests to them, God appears to them, get this vision, this. You know, download, getting downloads is only the first part. People think that when they get downloads, wow, you know, your pride go, wow. You look like you got wings growing on your back. You're like angels now. But you look carefully, yeah, it's your shoulder blade sticking up. <laughs> getting downloads, it's just an ability to rest and allow the vision to come, correct? Chapter 15 is the ability to absorb all those things and produce the fruit. Which is, at times I tell, you know, some people that I visit, I say, look, so and so has this vision, so and so has this vision, sister so and so has this vision, this one. at least five, six people have vision on your healing. So I ask a question, where are they now? 
I'm the only one right here still believe the vision. Because having the vision is one thing. Seeing the vision true is another thing. That separates a whole group of people. Of course, some of you might not have that many visions yet. You're still focusing on John 14. Jesus did the manifest to you. You need to learn to enter into the rest. And I've given you one of the reasons why you cannot appear to people. Too much complaining. Not enough thanksgiving. And you need to enter the place where you are just filled with praise and worship. Simple question, correct? Will God come to any place without worship? Will God visit any place without praise? No way! There must be the incense of worship and praise and thanksgiving. You must make it God-like before God comes. Even the four creatures are always saying, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God. I know one of the things that I was interested in as a musician. I was one day in my time with God, I said, I want to hear it exactly as they sang it. <coughs> to try to bring that music. We have probably, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of songs, holy, 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 correct? Each one, some of them very beautiful tune. And after hearing them a few times, this is what I tell you. Each time they sang was different. And it has never been the same. I say, wow. So some of you thinking they're very boring. You know, same song. Like some songs that even we Christians you sing and become quite boring. Or, you know, each song has their sugar cane. Then after you sing a while, the sugar cane gets dry. All the juice is squeezed up. Like, you know, and there's no oom to sing it anymore. But then, after a while you didn't sing, it still can come back. But you keep singing, 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 oh, no more, no more juice to squeeze out of it. Like the anointing of that song is gone. Each time they sang, it was different. And since that time, until eternity, each time is different. Wow. John 15. We must bear fruit. And when you look at the second level of relationship, that's when Jesus says, I now call you friends. Because the friends know what the master is doing. Look at verse 15. See, now he's working through you. Your soul has been done. Your spirit has been done. You understand all things. He is your friend. A servant doesn't know, only obey. That's like 14. He's still, he's still working in you. But as a friend, you know what he's doing. And he tells you what he's doing. And so it's a different level of relationship. But one emphasis, love, love. The whole emphasis in chapter 15 is one thing. Remember, in chapter 14, I emphasize only one thing, thanksgiving, grateful heart, correct? How do you let God work through you? There is a secret. You must remain in the position of love. Without love, God cannot work through you because God is love. And the whole chapter emphasizes about bearing fruit. Bearing fruit can be in uh, changing people's lives, discipleship, winning converts, and more of the fruit of the Spirit in our life. Actually, the answer is both. In proportion to how much love is in your life, the results of that love come forward. Didn't the Apostle Paul say, you can give all your body to be burned. You can prophesy until you got no more voice. That's my devotion. You can have faith to move every mountain until we cannot find any more mountains. But you have not love. You have not. The beneficial effects of a spiritual office and a spiritual gift is based on love. 
which means that you might be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and function in that ministry and have no love. Do you know in Jesus' sight, you got no fruit? You can have the gifts of the Spirit functioning in your life. All 12 gifts. Or 9 gifts. And you have no love. You have no fruit. And what did Jesus say about those with no fruit? He takes away. And look, He has already taken some away because they have no love. They have no love. As I said, and by the way, and those here online here, COG International has released a statement on all the recent events. And they've all stand together in a, because the rebels and issue statement. We have an official statement. If you want that, write to Colleen. Give it to you. All our leaders have it. And also, I have a short synopsis of uh, you know, answering the main accusation. I have also passed that to Colleen as a summary. And at the end of the day, I say it's nobody's business. Personal correspondence is nobody's business. No matter how juicy it is, there's a context to it. It's nobody's business. So you want those that copy, write to Colleen. We have that. By the end of the day is this. And I said at the end of that one, I said, I have lived my life in good conscience with God. And I challenge anyone in my position who has to balance the written word, the spoken word, the visions, the end time thing, with all the things that God and with the prophetic thing God asks you to do. And live up a better life. Come. I don't think they could improve on what I have done. But at the end of the day, I also say this. And I say, I have not broken any of the Ten Commandments. All these episodes. So, my conscience is clear. But then to those who are friends and all that, I added another statement. I said, look, even if I had actually made a mistake, I'd fallen. The right thing to do is to come around me, pray for me, and lift me up. And help me to the place where God called me to be. Correct? So on both sides, you must exercise love. If I live my life as righteously and clear conscience as I could, you must support. Even if there were some mistakes to make, and that happened, very isolated, because none of the ministry was neglected, none of the praying and preaching was neglected, then the right thing was also to come around and help lift me up. The wrong thing is to actually come. Oh, the person made this mistake. Nice! <coughs> Only non Christians do that. So the problem not enough love. Would you have done that to anybody else if your father made a mistake? Will you take a knife and chop your father? Or you come alongside and help? If people, now hindsight is easier than foresight. And then in the middle of it is very hard to see. And I always tell people this, if you hear the teaching, when you don't know what to do, always walk in a path of love. And you will end up in the right place. Don't take any other road. Ask yourself, what would Jesus do? What would love do? Then you'll find your way through the jungle. In John 15, without all this drama, the most important thing in our life, which I have been doing all my life, is to make sure I walk the walk of love. That the love of God is still in my heart, and that I treat people the way love would treat them. 
nothing less. And Jesus actually tests that. You see, after he talked about bearing fruit, immediately he says, let my words abide in you. In verse 7, and you will have what you desire, it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciple. But what does it mean? He says, as the Father loved me, I have loved you. Abide in my love. People know about abide in the word, correct? Do you know that you cannot abide in the word without abiding in his love? That is just a few verses down in verse 9. Question, what does it mean to abide in, in love? Abide in love means in any situation, I will check the love of God in my heart and make sure if I step a bit to the left or a bit to the right, that I'm still walking in love. A bit to the back, a bit to the front, I must still be in love. If I step, overstep to the place where I don't feel love anymore, I feel anger and other things, then I must quickly step back. That's called abiding inside the love, correct? Just like, wait, what does it mean to abide in the Word? That means, if I step to the left, I step to the right, I step to the back, I step to the front, I must make sure I'm in line with the Word. People are so conscious of trying to be in line with the written word, in line with the written word. They step out of love. Do you know the Pharisees use the word, the written word and the scriptures without love? And they all died and today are in hell. Abide in the word and abide in Jesus and abide in love to be successful to bear fruit. And no human being no ministry, no apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, no gifted person on this planet can ever bear fruit for Jesus without love. And without, without fruit, you are taken away. So it is very, very, very important that we learn to abide in love. And that is the test. You know, in John 14, the test is, I'm always yielded, always at rest, let Jesus work in me. How do I do that? Thanksgiving. Spirit of thanksgiving and worship. Anything that gets spend thanksgiving in the cause is praise into his, at his throne with worship. As long as you do that, he can write into you. In John 15, the key to this, I know that we will fulfill the vision and this vision will come to pass and we will reach all 6 billion people, two-thirds of population of planet Earth, because we still walk in love. Remember, there is no fruit if you don't walk in love. And people who don't walk in love will never ever have fruit in their life until they change and begin to walk in love. The criteria of bearing fruit is to abide in the love. Isn't it interesting? Jesus said, you must bear fruit. If you don't bear fruit, you're taken away. Then the next thing he commands is, make sure you obey my commandment to love one another. Implying that you cannot have number one without number two. They're intricately connected. And Paul sealed that in 1 Corinthians 13, say, you can prophesy, you can see visions, you can give to the poor, you can have all those things without love, you are nothing. Paul emphasizes that. So here he say that the most important commandment to bear fruit is to make sure you are walking in love. I always check my heart. Whatever happens, whether I'm in a valley or a mountain, whether I'm in the oasis or I'm in the desert, whether I'm in a stormy sea or in a calm, peaceful lake, I always check. Am I still in love with God and in love with people? Do I still have the love of God? The moment your answer is no, quickly get back. Because you are ineffective without love. Didn't Paul at the end of 1 Corinthians 14 says, I will show you a better way. Because the better way is the only way where they give bad fruit. Wasn't it the Corinthians who were a gifted people? And Paul said they got division and schism. It was not benefiting anybody. And they were like tearing each other up. And Paul says, you like one thing, love. 
Only love can produce fruit. And not only fruit, fruit that remains. Fruit that remains. Then he talks about if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch. And then he talks about what happened. The branch is withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire that is there. And uh, that is our Lord. And then he commands, if you keep my commandment, if you keep my commandment, and what is his main commandment? Love. You will abide in my love, just as I kept my father's commandments, and abide in his love. He says he was an example. Jesus, they tried to ruffle his feathers, ruffle his hair, persecute him, do things to him, and Jesus always walked in love. Even at the cross, when they jeered him, he had love, correct? He was caring for the thief that believed in him. He was caring for John and the mother. And he's hanging there on the cross for us. When they whip him, he had love. When he was carrying the cross and the women are crying, he said, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. He had love flowing out through him. You cut every cut that they cut on Jesus, love flow up. Can that happen to you? When they put the nails on you, will love come out? When they slice you, will love come out? When they stab you on the back, will you have love coming out? Choose to have love coming out. That's my choice. Once you make the choice, your fruit is guaranteed. That's all. It's because the fruiting is not you. Is Jesus through you? After all, the nutrition for the fruit came from our Lord. We are only the branch. He is the vine. As long as you abide, abide is the branch must stick to the tree, correct? Or the main stem. And to stay in the main stem, you must have abide in Jesus, abide in the Word. And abide in love. If you don't abide in love, it's like this whole arm is torn up. Can that branch bear fruit? No, it will wither and die. Connect back to love, fruit will come. That is Jesus' requirement. And then his standard of love, he says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friend. You know, one of the hardest things I tell the people, even in March last year, 2006, I said, look, during the rebellion in Australia, I said, look, you guys can do this, do that, do this, do that, do that. At the end of the day, you know, I'm the one who end up to preach. I've got to find the love to preach. I cannot preach angrily. I've got to find the revelation to preach. I've got to find the strength to still lead the prayer meeting where you can enjoy the prayer meeting. And in every prayer trip that we go through, I'm working. It's not just a holiday. Sometimes we take one, two days to rest. Because everybody's looking to draw from me. I'm working. And so, and I said, I used to say, I said, look, you can do all those things, but if the pulpit is empty, how is the church going to continue? So it is. And I say, after you slice me, cut me up, do this, do this, I still got to stand up and look at you guys and preach a good message. Because the Sunday still had to go on. Implying, have you guys no sense of how to solve these things and move forward. And that's one of the things I also tell my spouse at that time. I say, look, you can pick a fight all those things. At the end, I'm going to stand in front of the pulpit and get my spirit right and hear God. Not an easy thing. But always you got to come back and say, okay, I'm in here because of the 
ministry. And all of you know, I'm not in this move for the money. I could have more money outside. And you also know I'm not in this move for fame. Ask, what is my motive in this move? Of course, the enemy will say, oh no, it's after all these girls and all those things, nonsense. That's why the enemy tried to plant wrong thought. Why am I here? I am here because I want to finish what Jesus asked me to do. That's the only thing. Sometimes the sheep behave horribly, but I have to keep loving them and slowly, you know, nurse them to the place where God wants to be. And because I have to bring them to Jesus. It is like laying down your lives. Laying down your lives for these people. And the only reason I continue is I say, if no one continues, what will happen to the messages, to the warnings that God had? Like Paul, I say, love constrain me. And people make themselves unlovable. And then you've got to find the love to love them. And sometimes I wish, why don't people make themselves a little bit more lovable? Make my job easier. They make themselves unlovable and then you've got to go find the love for them and love them into the kingdom, into the greatness of God. Like Paul says, love constrains him. And I am very much like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul got no, mo no motivation for being in the ministry. He could be a rich person outside of the ministry. He could have less suffering outside of the ministry. But he still chose ministry because it's the call of God. And as he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, I will not be disobedient to the heavenly vision either. To me, my most important concern is, at the end of the day, I want to stand before our Lord Jesus Christ together with my soulmate and say, we have finished the work you call us to. That's it. And I know that as long as I do it according to Jesus, the fruit will bear itself. And that's what every one of you must be able, you live for only one thing, to do God's perfection. To do God's perfect will. That you want to finish what God asks you to do, because to all of us, this life is very short. We might have 40 odd years more, but it's still very short. In the blink of an eye, this life is over and we are all for eternity there. With millions and trillions of years. So in this short life, let's run the race with love. Let's finish it with love. And let's grow in love. And it's when you're at this point, in verse 16, you realize. Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go out and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain. See the word remain? Whatever you ask the Father in my name, give you. These things I command you that you love one another. And then he talks about how the world hates them. In the midst of growing in love, you will hate trust in you. He says, in verse 18, if the world hates you, he hated me before he hated you. But you must grow in love and we must become a people of love. You know what is the glorious church? People think, wow, glory, power, shining like the sun and all this. You know where all the glory and power is coming from, correct? From love. It's the love that must be there. And here's the good thing. Love must be tested. When you're put with unlovable people, you need a greater measure of love to love. I always see that as a challenge of love. And to me, the struggle is this. Sometimes you struggle to love people. You struggle because people make themselves unlovable. People do things that make you, you know, say, you know, think, you know, wow, why are they doing that? But at the end of the day, you must bring yourself to the position I choose to still love and help this person. 
when you keep choosing love, it is like on chapter 14, you choose thanksgiving. Right? Left, right, center, everything is telling you not to give thanks. You are like Job. You have people around say, curse God and die! And you say, no, 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 I will worship God. So, in chapter 15, to bear fruit, you must keep choosing to love. You must do two things. You must be the personification of love. You must walk and work out the love of God. So, you choose to love, you choose to love, you choose to love, you choose to love God and love people. You keep choosing and you keep walking in love and you keep acting in love. And you keep doing things that are out of the love of God. Guaranteed, you will bear fruit. Sometimes it might take time for the fruit to come. But the fruit will be there. The whole chapter 15 is about the secret of remaining loving to God and to people. The secret of John 14 is to remain a worshipper of God who have only thanksgiving all the time. Never move out of thanksgiving. The secret of John 15 is to remain in the love of God. And in the end, it's not your love and my love. It's the love of God that flows through. And I must find God's love for the person. Then I will have the love of God for them. That is the struggle. Remember John 14, the struggle is to give thanks. The struggle is not how much money you have. The struggle is not how successful you are. Because success will surely come. Finances and blessings will surely come. Positions of blessing will surely come. The struggle is whether you will worship God. Remember, God warned the people. After you're eaten and are full, He's going to watch whether you give thanks. He told the Israelites in Deuteronomy. And the struggle of bearing fruit is simple. It's not really the struggle of healing somebody. Not the struggle of bringing power to somebody. Not the struggle to go and raise somebody from the dead. The real struggle is the struggle to love. When you love enough, the miracles will come. When you love enough, the disciples will come. When you love enough, the converts will come. The struggle is the struggle to walk and remain in the love of God. So let's enter into the fullness of God to let the visions of God flow through us. And in prayer, pray through all these things. Let's all rise together.